in forming a community, yeah. I find that has been a very helpful tenant, right? To to create the, you know, it's, I'm sure this gets referenced all the time. You build it and they will come. That whole uh -huh. field of dreams thing, right? And I think that's true. And I also think that it may not happen exactly like you think it will happen. Yeah. And yet it will happen, right? You'll bump into all sorts of interesting people and characters and uh, that will come in and out of it. And I think the best that as an organizer I can do is set the environment as, as much as I would want it to be if I were a guest, right? Like make the thing I would come to, right? And the, how it looks, how it feels, the vibe of the whole thing, how we are with each other, how the service goes, right? Uh, and then release the outcome. Hi there, and welcome back to the Community Strategy Podcast. My name is Deb Show. if you're first joining us. Today, I've got a special guest. Uh, one of my really uh, dear friends is here. Uh, I'm happy to introduce Reverend Mike Travisano, an ordained Buddhist priest, mindfulness instructor, and integrative group therapy facilitator for an intensive outpatient program for adolescent, adolescents and young adults. Mike is also the founder of The Art of Monday Morning, a company that provides mindfulness instruction to in individuals and organizations. Uh, welcome, Mike, to the podcast. So happy to be here. Thank you, Deb. I am thrilled to have you here today. Um, for those listening, uh, for you listening out there, Mike and I met probably about two and a half years ago. Yeah. I, I don't so, remember... Yeah. You did a workshop at the Freebird Yoga yeah. Studio. Yep. Yeah. Um, it was like a mindfulness workshop, I think. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that, that's in um, Mechanicsburg uh, in Pennsylvania here. And I went to that. It was like, a, I think it was like three hours or something. And through that, um, I really enjoyed the time. And then you had mentioned about your group on Monday evenings. Um, and so I started going to those and I've been going to those ever since. And so I wanted to bring you uh, onto this podcast, not only to share your experience that I've had the joy and pleasure of having with you and with your group that you've been facilitating in person, but and also the ones that you've been doing online earlier this year, but also because um, it's just fun to talk with people who I get to work with in person, because that's not something I usually talk about on the podcast. <laughs> it's usually <laughs> people I'm talking to, you know, is an online community and we've done online with you and in person. So I just want to tell everybody that heads up for yeah. the, the listeners there and share a little bit more about you and your background with us first, if you could. Sure. So uh, I spent most of my career not in in teaching mindfulness or being a or Buddhist priesting, things like that. I, I worked for in technology and finance for, for a long time uh, in software um, and, and sort of came about this whole thing as a, as a, you know, like so many of us, is, you know, these things are journeys, <laughs> right? And it, I, I, I often joke that like the 20 year old inside of me is continues to look at me like, we're doing what now, dude? What? What is we? What is what's happening? So, so, so yeah. So, uh, but I uh, entered the the seminary in in 2019, 2020, wow. something like that. I didn't yeah. realize it was that recent. Like, yeah, that's not recent. Yeah. but it but feels pretty recent. recent. It's pretty recent. Yeah, right. So I've been I've been practicing mindfulness since I was, I was a kid, right? I, in kung fu class, we used to meditate, and I really liked it, which was weird because a lot of a lot a lot of people didn't, <laughs> right? They were like, "Let's get on to the punching," oh, you know? and, yeah. and I just liked it. So, uh, so I kept up with it, right, over the years, and I studied with different teachers and uh, met some. You meet some pretty far out people, that's for sure, when you you know swim in the waters. In fact, it's kind of difficult often to find really um, pragmatic, evidence-based, <laughs> you know, like very like reasonable people. You can kind of dive into different things. Anyway, uh, so over the course of my life, though, so through through work and life and getting married and having a kid and, and really wild changes in my own career, 
death of my father, you know, lots of things sort of conspired to get into it in a much more serious way. And so, so yeah, seminary happens there. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not sure what else might be helpful to, to tell you about it. So you went to seminary in 2020, is that what you just said? Yeah, so that's, and that's a, uh, in our tradition, that's a three year endeavor. So two years of kind of very typical, which you would imagine any kind of uh, advanced graduate degree, right? So lot, lots of reading, lots of reading, lots of paper writing, right? Lots of def quote unquote defending your, your thoughts mm -hmm. You know that you wrote about right but it's a it's a buddhist seminary so the defense is is pretty kind <laughs> right <laughs> uh and then the and then there's a final year that we call a plunge and and uh, during that time you can kind of focus on whatever you're drawn to so uh some folks go into chaplaincy and become chaplains at hershey medical center for instance a few have done that maybe working in the community uh, on a variety of issues, maybe working with the unhoused or working on substance use recovery or um, or mindfulness uh, counseling, care, instruction. And that's really where I, I really, really liked that. I, I had done, once upon a time, I had worked uh, with a partner uh, in organizational development. And we taught things like leadership and communications and things like that that you bump into. Uh, and so I, I had uh, uh, an interest in that stuff anyway, right? And I, I liked working with people and working with companies and stuff like that. So I, I got into doing that and found very, very quickly that um, nothing changes your, ex your own practice of this stuff than working directly with people, specifically working with people who are going through stuff, right? Uh, and nothing sharpens your sword quite quite like somebody looking at you and saying, help me, right? That, you know, you find out, I found out specifically very quickly that little, you know, fun, hopeful Instagram quotes, they only go so far, <laughs> right? <laughs> really? <laughs> They're like, yeah, great quote, <laughs> you know, <laughs> help me. So, <laughs> so, uh, so over the years that, that uh, since then, uh, it's been, um, yeah, heck of an experience. So that has, so you went through seminary that brought you to some experiences where you were in the field and you got to choose maybe some different pathways that you decided. Yeah. Tell me when you kind of, I know you, you were part of the um, larger dragonfly um, community, <laughs> correct? Yeah, still am. So in, in where we are in Harrisburg area, central Pennsylvania area, the, our community is known as the Order of the Dragonfly or the Dragonfly Sangha. Sangha is just a, a, a Pali or Sanskrit word. I can't remember which one it is. I guess it doesn't matter for this podcast, but geez, I should probably figure it out. <laughs> uh, that just means community, right? It's just a word that means community. And I've it's heard a it really. In both, actually. I've heard I was. I, I that's feel what like I've heard it in too. both. <laughs> so, um, and, and it's a real big part of, of the practice in, a, in a, of itself. I, I don't mean to over Buddha your listeners, but there's this thing we do where we take refuge in the three jewels. And the three jewels are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And, the, and really, they're, they're stand-ins for very um, practical things. Like the Buddha, when we take refuge in the Buddha, all we're doing is taking refuge in the idea that there was a dude who found the end of suffering. He wasn't a god, he wasn't anything special, right? He was just a guy and he figured it out. And therefore, so can we, we can figure it out too. The Dharma is just a word that means the teachings, right? So the stuff, and in many ways, the Dharma doesn't have to be limited to Buddhist stuff. It can be teachings on Christianity or, or modern psychology or science and whatever, right? Anything that helps you to, to end suffering for yourself and others. And then the third one, Sangha, is community. This recognition that we're not in, you know, we're in this love together, right? Like we're all in the same boat. We're all like making our way through this wild mystery of life 
where some of it feels very, very good, but a lot of it doesn't. And uh, maybe we can, you know, grab a hold of each other and give a, a push or a pull to help along the way. So community becomes a, I mean, it's a jewel of the practice. Well, and it's, it's pivotal to, to, to change, I think, to implementing um, those different principles. I keep forgetting what they're called. <laughs> No, well, that principles, I think, yeah, I think it works just fine, you know, uh, as, a, as a term. Um, the practice itself and mindfulness practice itself is, is inherently a personal practice, right? It's based on my own experiences. And you can absolutely, you know, go Zen master yourself in a, into a cave, for, you know, and stay on a mountain for forever. Uh, and it's pretty useful to have others to help you, right? That uh, to send up smoke signals or point the way or give, or give some support, right? In a very human way to what's, to what's happening here, you know? Uh, and so it becomes really important. Yeah. Um, do you know why it's called dragonfly? Cause I kept wanting to ask you that and I forgot to ask you before now. So. Yeah, yeah. So for years, it was called the Blue Mountain Lotus Society. And in fact, you kind of run into that still sometimes in different places, Blue Mountain Lotus Society. Uh, but in the 90s, the, I think there, there's, a, there's another center in Carlisle recently. Uh, well, I said the 90s, but that doesn't make sense. The, the order started in 1996 in the area. So it's been around since then. But I don't know when this happened, but a community formed in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which is relatively close. And I think they're the Blue Lotus Society or something like that. And, and uh, instead of trying to like, get into like, <laughs> Buddhist, Buddhist beef, you know, like some sort of like, you know, conflict over the name, um, uh, the, the head of our uh, order, uh, the Reverend Dr. Uh, Anthony Stoltz, changed it to the dragonfly sangha. The dragonfly has a, you know, in, in Buddhism, there are all sorts of symbols of change, inherent change, right? There's the lotus where, you know, the, you know, no mud, no lotus, the idea that a lotus, that beautiful flower doesn't grow despite the mud, it grows because of it. The, they're the same, very much the same way. There's a life cycle of the dragonfly that is appropriate. It goes through massive amounts of change in all sorts of different environments, coming to this, what we think is a pretty beautiful creature out there that, uh, you know, symbolizes freedom. Yeah, I love that. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Hey. Um, yeah, and uh, you've brought Tony to our uh, meetings a couple times uh, throughout <laughs> the past couple of years, yep. Yeah, there. and pretty smart, pretty smart cookie. And what? <laughs> I said he's a pretty smart cookie. He's so a he's pretty smart there. cookie. Yeah, he, I, I, uh, I've been reading his book, his newest book, and so that's been really interesting. Yeah, you know, you've cool. been reading it too. So yeah, yeah. Um, so tell me, um, what brought you to starting, um, either I guess our group first, and then we can talk about the art of Monday morning. I don't know which came first, so. Yeah, you know, they kind of, they, they originated sort of from the same place, right? Uh, um, but yeah, I'll take them in kind. Uh, so for years, there was a house of meditation that our community met at. And it was over on, uh, outside of Harrisburg, just a little bit. And it was there since, I think, the early 2000s, or maybe even older. Maybe it was even 98 or something like that. I'm not sure. Is it on Front Street? No, it was okay. it was on Linglestown Road. Okay, I think, yeah, Linglestown Road, um, and and that's where you know we would lead meditation services and do retreats and the whole thing. It's really kind of a cool little you know house to have. Uh, over the course of the pandemic, right, like so many things, uh, changes in the community alongside with the changes of going on with that, it it made sense, I guess, to give that house up to, to make a change. And so we were looking for a new space to, to do the same thing. And I had uh, kind of fallen in love with the idea of, of having these services, meeting with people, sort of being able to, for free, 
give people a place to come and um, take a little refuge, maybe learn some stuff that hopefully would be helpful. Uh, and sort of a, a, a line that goes through the whole thing is that uh, when, when I do these things, right, I, I get a ton of benefit out of them. Right, like just in it again. It's like the magic of community, right? Like it's it's very well balanced, with that you have people that are coming that are interested, and anything that I might do or say is no indication of like you know my own abilities or like achievement on the on the <laughs> path to a light enlightenment, but rather it's it's just a means to be able to talk about stuff that I find really, really helpful and cool, and in doing so, be helped, right? Uh, and so uh, we, we were looking for a place to, to do it. And we found a couple of different, you know, places, some yoga studios and uh, other things that were, that were willing to host us. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we're part of a really, really great interfaith community in the area here. We have been for years. So throughout the year, there's all sorts of interfaith services, you know, where there's different Christian churches and Jewish organizations and, and uh, uh, the main mosque in Harrisburg and Hindu organization and uh, Baha'i and uh, gosh, there's, there's quite a few. Uh, and we'll do services together. We'll do different sort of outreach things together or um, and in doing that we have really wonderful relationships with all sorts of churches in the area and other spiritual traditions and very much respect them and love uh, the respect they have for each other and for us so uh, the Mount uh, uh, Calvary Episcopal Church in Camp Hill said you're welcome to use our our undercroft is what they call that that sort of that area that we meet in and so um and so we in 29 no 2021 uh i started no 2022 sorry i'm like getting all my my days mixed up 2022 we started uh doing them there and yeah yeah so so putting that community together at first was a, ma a matter of outreach to the members of of the sangha as it is you know like we've been around for a while it's a pretty large email list of of folks and those first couple of months there was there were quite a few folks that would come from afar buddhism in and of itself is is an interesting tradition in that uh even though it's going to sound like i'm going back on that importance of community but a lot of you know there's a little bit of an aversion to church churchness right among buddhists right uh, and so um, it's not always going to be filled right with the same people or with, you know, uh, or with necessarily people that have been around for forever, right? Uh, so in addition to reaching out to there, I started the meetup group, meetup.com, and I put it together and put it out there and just started advertising that we're doing this. And I think on the whole, uh, week over week, I, we, I find we have anywhere from you know, these days, in the least, maybe eight or nine people, in the most, maybe 16 or 17, right? And and there's a core group that, that I can sort of expect to see and say hello to. And then there's always sort of a, a, a new folks coming in and, you know, maybe hanging out for a couple of months and then something changes and then we don't see them, for, but then they come back, you know, and so there's this really interesting and cool uh, breathing of the community that happens of folks coming in and, and by its nature, I, I want to foster that, you know, the no big dealness of it, right? To, to come when it, when it feels good to come and to be cool with it. If, you know, to be cool with no matter what happens, right? And maybe that's, uh, you didn't ask the question, but but in in, in forming a community, yeah. I find that has been a very helpful tenant, right? To to create the you know, it's, I'm sure this gets referenced all the time. You build it, and they will come. That whole uh -huh. field of dreams thing, right? And I think that's true. And I also think that it may not happen exactly like you think it will happen. 
and yet it will happen, right? You'll bump into all sorts of interesting people and characters and uh, that will come in and out of it. And I think the best that as an organizer I can do is set the environment as, as much as I would want it to be if I were a guest, right? Like make the thing I would come to, right? And the, how it looks, how it feels, the vibe of the whole thing, how we are with each other, how the service goes, right? Uh, and then release the outcome. Yeah, it's setting up the uh, conditions for everything to kind of unfold. And um, our the last, the podcast that just came out this week um, was with a, a woman who was talking similarly about uh, being okay with like letting, telling people, people they can leave if they are not interested in participating, like giving them the out so that you have them buying into staying there and saying, but I know you do that several times in, in the service. Like if we're going over at the end or something, you're like, yeah, you need to leave if you need to go. Um, and so, you know, no hard feelings or whatever. Um, <laughs> and so I think that's a really important factor that a lot of people maybe don't necessarily think about is, is just saying those things of, whatever is okay and letting go of the outcome of I need to have so many people here to make this possible or to have this continue. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, I, I think, I think it would be uh, not very human of me to not acknowledge that. I think whenever you create something like this, you want to open the doors and have them clamor, right? Like, Oh my gosh, it was 20 last week, but it's 50 this week. Oh my gosh. You know, and, and it's yeah. just, and uh, but what I have found is uh, a, about the dozen of us or so who now know each other mm -hmm. and they greet each other and 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 there are completely authentic, non creepy, weird hugs that happen. Right. <laughs> you know, like there's there's like a, a sense of community. There's a sense of like, I'm, I'm how are you? I want to, and, and I want to hear what you say when you give me a response or celebrate something or grieve, grieve on something. About a year ago, we had one of our long time, one of the regulars pass away unexpectedly. And, and for a community to experience, you know, not only new people that we're excited about, but also very um, real human things to go on inside of it, uh, the only way to 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 embrace that is to embrace it right. is to is to be look out for each other mm -hmm. yeah wow. so uh, yeah i like, i know i, I didn't I go in next with that <laughs> well you know you asked about the art of monday morning i'm happy to go into it yeah it, you know uh, just it it was the business arm right so the the Monday night community will always be free, right? Like that's it's uh, uh, my deep pleasure <laughs> to do to do it that way, and um, you know mindfulness instruction and coaching and things like that as a, as a service, you know, seems to be in a very good place right now uh, for folks and for for companies and for any anyone who is looking to uh, sharpen their sword of how they think and the quality of their thinking right mindfulness these days often gets equated with meditation right and so oh you're doing mindfulness you're meditating but that's really really uh not not so true, at least in a traditional sense. And I don't want to beat up any definitions that maybe people find helpful, but the way we see it is that mindfulness has more of a, meditation has the quality of how skillful am I in pointing my brain where I choose to point it, where mindfulness is much more of a self-inquiry kind of thing. Like, what's going on for me? Do I understand where that might be coming from? And if it's not helpful, or effective is there something else i can i can move to that is and so uh, it's pretty valuable and powerful skill it sort of implies that i create my own experiences 
that I don't, that life, the great fish hook of life doesn't have to sink itself in my cheek and take me wherever it wants to go, that I have say in it. And so, and this is a skill that you can learn. And so the Art of Monday Morning was created to help people do that. Mm -hmm. And help you um, develop a marketing plan, I'm guessing around, or maybe like some sure. kind of that you're posting on sure. social media. So getting into like the business aspect of this, um, you're doing some of that. And this is helping you, um, you know, supplement the, the you know, because you're doing those things for free on Mondays, this is where you're maybe bringing in some of that money. But I know you still have a full-time job, I'm pretty sure. I do not. I oh, do you not. don't? This is it. I, remember. I do not. Yeah. Yeah. So I left my full-time gig in healthcare uh, a year ago, April. Oh, okay. So, so it's been a bit over a year. I've been, I've been sort of full-time supporting clients uh, privately with the Art of Monday Morning. And, I, and as you mentioned in the introduction, I work uh, as a, a contractor for a uh, company called Charlie Health. Charlie Health is an intensive outpatient program, a telehealth uh, solution for uh, adolescents, young adults, and actually some adults these days. Uh, and what the program provides is mental health services, intensive mental health services for people who otherwise might not have access to it, right? So. Uh, maybe they would benefit from an inpatient service, but there's no openings for two months, say. Or maybe they just live in a part of the country that uh, just doesn't have access to it. But Charlie Health, they can go from calling and finding information to uh, speaking with people in a therapeutic way in just a couple of days. So uh, I very much value that part of the work. It's uh, incredibly uh, rewarding to be able to help people who really need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you also work with companies, you said? I do, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, on sort of a different, it's funny, you know, you would think that these are very different kinds of work, right? Helping a teenager who's going through a severe depression, right? Versus helping uh, a team align around some objective that they want right but the the secret is it's the same right because they're all about the human brain and how we operate on the stories we tell ourselves and if the quality of my story is uh detrimental then my results are going to be detrimental and i don't want to overly uh you know somebody who's suffering from severe depression there's more to it than just the story, right? I don't don't want to just write that off. I do, however, want to suggest that the human brain is going to human brain, <laughs> you know, in all of us, right? And it's always a factor. And so um, if I am starting to think about how much work sucks on Sunday morning, then maybe my thinking about work could use some help. And so we found a lot of success uh, working with teams, working with leaders, right, on being able to identify what's the quality of my thinking here, right, and what's the story I would rather have that's every bit is true. I'm not, this isn't the power of positive thinking, right, that doesn't work because it's not grounded in something that one believes. But what's the story about what I really am doing here? And so, um, yeah, we've had some really, really wonderful success working with companies on that. That's super exciting. And it's interesting, yeah. like you said, how it can transfer to, to many different um, groups of people and individuals that can really benefit from it because it's not just structured for, for one kind of a person. It's, it's something that can be flexed and opened and um, yeah. shifted for people and depending on what their needs are. So yeah. it's really... Yeah. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so I have a question from a community member. And uh, that question is, what is your, what do you think is a special or different about the Monday night group um, than maybe other communities or groups that you've been a part of? Uh, that was from Tim. <laughs> All right. So, uh, that's different or special from other communities I've been a part in. Yeah. Uh, 
I I think the Monday night group has uh, it's not at all unlike uh, a really good like band band right <laughs> band yeah like like a jazz like trio or quartet or something right where everybody is playing to the middle you know is the phrase that you use and that stuff right like no like even though on monday night you know i i <laughs> i you know i wear the robe and i sit on a on a cushion and stuff like that right and i i'm the one that leads the the words that we might recite right but it's best when everybody's leaning in right and my role is not so much that like that that it's much more the role of a facilitator than it is a leader right some of the best stuff hands down the most powerful stuff has not come from me right i think of a couple of times where community members have like opened up and shared something and i couldn't speak afterwards yeah. right and so uh i am very very grateful to be able to to set up an environment where that kind of thing can happen and so um that's the best every other community i think i can recall being a part of including playing music with other people <laughs> right has has always had an element of me in it like i want it to happen this way i want right um, and so it becomes inflexible right and and more rigid um and being able to sort of lean in to whatever the moment is asking in the context of what we've kind of formed but lean into the moment whatever it's asking has to me made it really frankly my it's my favorite thing i do all week yeah you know that's so cool um what would you like to share about community building or tips that you have for other people, whether it be in person or online in either facilitating or guiding or creating the space? Like, are there any go-to things that you would want to say to a community builder listening? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, step into it, right? Step into it and, and um, start to, if you haven't, already done this uh, start to imagine that there really is no such thing as failure just redirection mm. right uh, recognize that if you do everything and nobody comes it doesn't mean your group or your community is a failure it just means something was not you know the condition wasn't right for f folks to come right you can do something about that you can make a decision about that it's hard though right a lot of community builders want to build a community where where it's where it's great right and tons of people come and it's highly valued and it leads to other incredible things and oh my gosh you know it's wonderful uh, but i think when you can go into it from a place of uh, personal responsibility that i'm going to set this up as best as I can to be the thing that I would most want to come to and then just really, really play that uh, as best as you as you can see failure, not as failure, but see it as redirection. OK, I'm going to I'm going to make an adjustment here and and step into it. Right. Feel try things, try things and, and bob and weave and and change it and um, listen to feedback. And be open to changing things, even if it's stuff that you really, really feel strongly about, <laughs> you know, still be open to maybe giving it a, a change, you know, I think I would, I think I would recommend that. Okay. I, you know, it was funny because I was actually thinking while you were talking about how, you know, it's very much uh, flowy in our group where we just kind of, you know, people talk and other people talk and you talk and, but it's fun. And I think one of the things that I never thought would, would be <laughs> was coming <laughs> to a Buddhist service and it'd be fun. Like that wasn't something I ever would have, if somebody would said, I'm going to a Buddhist, I would have been like, Oh, that doesn't sound fun. <laughs> like, I don't know in the past <laughs> that might've been what I thought. So um, I think that's an important factor is, 
you make it fun and interesting, even if people, no matter what, how much people know about the topic, um, you try to meet people where they are and yeah. with an element of laughter and lightness and fun. It's, I mean, I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and, and I imagine there are many Buddhist communities who maybe aren't like that, that it is, you know, Buddhism is a 2,600 year old tradition that shows itself in a bajillion different ways, depending on how it's, where it is and how it is. And right. And so, uh, and I've heard from others, you know, who even go to some of the local other Buddhist organizations around here, that it's quite different there. Right. I'm not for a moment going to say, you know, put a qualitative a, a judgment on that, better or worse. I just know, just like we were talking about, like, this is the one I would want to go to, right? Where where it's fun and funny, and it means something, right? Because life is, is that, right? If you, if you can't um, laugh really hard somewhere, then you're less likely to be able to cry, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need both. And so if I don't set that environment where that both can happen, then what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we um, have developed a little community out of, um, out of our group of doing things outside of Mondays. Um, I know I've hosted a game night here at my place a couple of times yeah. and invited a bunch of our friends that have come. And um, yeah, and we've developed friendships and, well, now I've developed a relationship. I'm dating Tim, which right. is brand new. Uh -huh. um, and we met through there. So uh -huh. it's it's very interesting that, um, you know, this is what happens in life is you find you find kind of like the people that you want to hang out with from right. this foundation of um, we have things in common and we want to talk about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Our interests. Yeah. Right on. Wonderful. I love it. I love it. Very cool. Um, trying to think if there's anything else. What do you want to share about the Art of Monday morning's future and anything else that you are working on for the year? I know earlier in this year you were doing some of those um, virtual um, Sunday morning calls. And yeah. so I was curious if those are going to be coming back in the fall or if you have any other ideas for workshops or retreats or anything like that. I wasn't sure if you have any thoughts yeah thank you so uh at the the sunday morning things are definitely going to come back i think we're targeting the end of september to start them back up sort of trying to get that magic moment where like summer is sort of like you know uh, uh sort of left and we've given over to you know uh fall uh, so we're going to start that up again. Uh, that will, I, I think, what I, what I discovered from a community building perspective was most successful when it was when it was focused and finite, right? One thing that the Monday night can be is um, forever, right? Because I'm going to release the outcome. If it's just me, I'm, I'm, I'll meditate for a little bit and then I'll go home, right? But the Sunday morning one I found was much more effective when it was, you know, we're going to go for six weeks and here are the topics and here's what to expect, right? Sunday morning is sort of a, maybe a more of an investment for people, right? So it's got to be, uh, I found it seemed a little wiser to market it much more. This is what you can expect. So yeah. we're, we'll do six weeks, you know, of something uh, starting, starting then. Um, so that's happening. Um, Mondays will continue to go. The uh, Yeah, I think that's, I think that's what I got. Is there any, um, I know that there's different holidays throughout the year. Is there any events that um, retreats that either of those different groups do? I didn't know that either. I was curious if there's any other, because you mentioned retreats a while ago, but I didn't know if there's any that yeah. you talk about on Mondays that I don't know. Yeah, you know, uh, once upon a time we would have, uh, so yeah, in, in the Buddhist calendar, at least in our tradition, we celebrate five or six days throughout the year, depending, uh, that mark sort of major events, either in the Buddha's life or things that we want to do. And then, then uh, for instance, in uh, a few weeks on the 19th of August, we'll celebrate Oban. Oban is uh, a Japanese 
a based Buddhist holiday. It's sort of a celebration of our ancestors, right? And then uh, right around Halloween is something called Segaki, which is a holiday where we um, sort of uh, look to give compassion to those elements within us that might be troubled, right? Um, Gaki are known as the hungry ghosts, and they sort of represent um, aspects within ourselves that are difficult. So Segaki is we feed the hungry ghosts within us, right? Offer compassion. And and often in those kinds of holidays, maybe we'll do a retreat. We haven't for a little bit, but maybe we will, right? Like have a day beforehand or make a weekend or something like that. Yeah, we probably are overdue for something a little bit longer than what we've been doing. Just curious. So yeah. good that... Uh... Yeah, that's all of that's happening. I'm still learning those different uh, holidays. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you uh, so much for being here. I know we went a little my bit pleasure. what I was going to do, but I had a, I questions under, in my pocket that I wanted to bring out, I guess. So <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for being here. Um, for anybody who's listening, just let them know the best place to um, get in touch with you if they're interested. Yeah, theartofmondaymorning.com. From there, you can reach out, you can find out more about our Monday night service services. That's where we'll post when we do the Sunday things again. There are blog entries and things like that that folks might want to check out. So the art of Monday morning dot com is the, is the best place. All right. And that'll be in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you. Deb -deb. Everybody... Yeah, yeah. For everybody listening, I hope you have enjoyed this episode. Maybe share it with somebody if you feel like uh, it might benefit them. And if you're so keen, you might be feeling like up for writing a review. That would be wonderful because I'm looking for some Apple reviews on the podcast. So uh, thanks again for listening. Have a great week and I will see you again later. Bye. Bye.